July of 69 when they went to the moon. And I'm telling you, this is just what Faye Ann Potter told me personally. And that was they saw something that followed them to the moon. Did not say <laughs> anything about anything on the moon. Nothing on the moon, but it was something that followed them to the moon. Y'all ready for this? I think we're opening the show. Dylan, if you don't get the f*** <laughs> Hey, Welcome. Dylan, could you kindly move out of the way? Cool. When you ready? Tell me when. Oh. We are not starting the show being mean to George. I will not f*** <laughs> Thank you! George, no, we'll start. Yeah! All right, lead us in. Lead us in. You're a great day! <laughs> Welcome back to Impulsive, the number one podcast in the world with the number one friend group in the world. <laughs> friendship. That's what it's about. It's about friendship. Bro, Let's <laughs> Hit that subscribe button if you guys are not subscribed yet. Thank you all genuinely from the bottom of my heart for listening, watching, viewing, and subscribing, and literally, yeah, making us shit. <laughs> not want to joke around one. with our friends ever. No, they don't. They, they were not having I, it. Well, I don't episode. understand. Maybe because they understand how many, my feelings. No, stop. Don't say that because they're going to believe you. I don't know how many times we have to go through this exercise with the third co-host where, where it's like, <laughs> they're being so mean to him again. I don't you know. didn't, George. You didn't stop. say anything. They're last... gone. I didn't even open my mouth on the last fucking show, and they're like, "He's such a fucking motherfucker." If I see him, I'll kill him. <laughs> yeah, you were way low energy. I know. Sorry. And, and sorry. You know sorry about that. Sorry about that. They're sick of. Uh, <laughs> they're sick of NFTs, man. Every yeah. They they don't want to hear any more about NFTs. They don't want to hear any more cryptocurrency. And what hurts me the most? <laughs> They're done with Pokemon. I'm not listening, no. They don't want to hear about Pokemon. I just got my first card today. I can't believe it. Rock rough. I'm, listen, I'm not so sure they want to hear anything. I think they're sick of all of it. <laughs> like, I think they'd prefer we just all just sit here and just look at the cameras with blank, blank stares sure. on our faces. Sure. Yeah, well, we are pretty good looking. Texas opened up. Texas is Wide open. open. Completely. Just f fuck it. COVID no longer exists. Wide open. Right? No, like, correct me if I'm wrong. No restrictions. None. No I masks. Woo! Back to normal Whoa. life. Wait, really? Yes. We should go visit and see how it is. Cause, it, dude, I watch movies where people walk around normally. And I'm like, <gasps> but it's like, well, how can you just decide that? Like, was it the governor who's like, nah, we're probably done with the virus? It was Newsom actually. He <laughs> called him. He said, hey, can you get Newsom going? made the decision for Texas. <laughs> could, say, could you guys do this? Uh, uh, do so this? his name is his name is uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Yeah. Texas Governor Greg Abbott. He said, I just announced Texas is open 100% everything. <laughs> I also ended the statewide mask mandate. And someone in the comments said, yeah, man, because anybody was wearing masks there anyways. Like, what did you actually just do? <laughs> hey, hey, but he, tw he tweeted that. So you don't even have to pass, like, like legislation and laws now, huh? You could just do it on Twitter? Yeah. That's cool. I think that's I think that's how it works. But uh, somebody just tweeted it. Y'all, y'all are free to <laughs> go about your lives. So, somebody Everybody favors it. <laughs> somebody in the comments said, uh, Having one state that does this while all the rest of the states don't is like having a, a piss in this area only section of the pool. Like you can only <laughs> pee in this area of the pool. <laughs> that is hilarious. But the well, if it was that funny, wouldn't you have fucking laughed? Does it. Yo, no bullying. Okay, okay. So this okay. is why you're no, mean no, to me. I'm so, you're mean to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm hurt. I'm just kidding. I feel like I'm just a, I'm an alien here, and I don't actually get along with you guys. I like and, what you're doing. But it's too early because I have one more thing. But nobody wants to hear it. No, they might want to. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. No, no right. bullying. We'll come back. No, no come bullying, back. Georgie. That hurt. That one hurt me. <laughs> you're stinging Mike. You hurt me. What you got? I see Aaron Carter pulled up on your on your Google. <sighs> That's what you This is making me nervous. I got a text message from Adam22 last night. No, no, not like this. He said, not like this. Aaron Carter. Does Car he have my chain? He said, yeah, he was wearing it. He was wearing the impulsive. You're chain. lying. He was. And it's, he's not doing well, boys. A Aaron Carter <laughs> went on Adam 22 show. Adam said, first and foremost, Adam 22 is the biggest shit starter I've ever met. Like, beyond anybody else. Like, he, do he does this on purpose, but he said, LOL. Aaron Carter just went in on Jake and Logan so bad. Tried to get him to talk about your breakup. He didn't really bite. I'm like, yeah, man, thanks for the sensitivity around such a painful experience. You know? No, I didn't say it. I said, you're a sick fuck. When's it going out? He said, next week. But supposedly, Aaron Carter had a lot to say about you and little brother Jakey, and he was rocking the impulsive chain with impunity, dog. That's so crazy. So is he a fan or a hater? Can you do uh, that? that you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's like, that's okay. like talking shit and wearing our merch. Yeah. Like, you're endorsing us? But then talking nah, shit. No, 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 it's not. It, he, 
it's like ro- it's like wearing some chain you robbed off a rapper you don't fuck. But with. it says in, like it he says, jacked that shit off you. It's no, I gave it to him. Nah, and it says this. Nah, on it. Like, <laughs> how much earned media is that? Bro, just... he popped your chain. You didn't do shit about it in the streets, bro. <laughs> you said you said Aaron Carter, you wear that. Shit. It's yours now. Just don't hurt me. I heard you. I was there, dude. I just didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to get involved. He was supposed to box uh, Lamar Odom. I saw what? for like a split. Oh second. yeah, that's right. I saw that too. Aaron Carter versus. Aaron Carter versus Lamar Odom. Strange times. Texas is open. I want to show a trailer here <laughs> <laughs> regarding uh, the guest's work. So this is a very exciting episode. Could be a pretty eerie episode, depending on what angle you view it through. But uh, <laughs> we're going to play this documentary uh, trailer right here for a, a movie, a film called The Phenomenon. Check this out, and then I'm going to bring the guest on. This is his work. Watch. Okay, watch. Are you watching? Go ahead. Watch now. I knew this was breaking news for the front page of the New York Times. Oh my gosh. Look at that thing. We need to accept that we are not alone in the universe. The federal government all these years has covered up everything. It's very, very bad for our country. There have been visitation, crashed craft, material recovered. It was not anything from this earth. All I could do is keep a mouth shut. The public has a right to know. There's a tremendous resistance. I guarantee every one of them knows that this event happened. Hiding these dark secrets even from elected presidents. They came running up here in such a panic. Child can't make that up. Declassified government documents confirm ongoing UFO incursions at nuclear weapons sites. Are you saying that there's some evidence that still hasn't seen the light of day? I'm saying most of it hasn't seen the light of day. These things are real. They're here. This is happening now. Our guest today is a UFO <laughs> expert and director of the groundbreaking documentary, The Phenomenon, which features high-ranking government officials speaking on what many of us to believe to be true. The alien spacecraft exist and have been visiting us for years. He's brought with him never-before-seen materials. Please welcome James Fox. <laughs> this is nutty. This is probably the most I've ever been excited. Yeah. Well, he's, got, he's got the secrets, potentially even... <laughs> The secret to the universe. What is it? How did we get here? Welcome to Impulsive, James. Oh, thanks so much for having me on, you guys. It's, it's exciting. Of course. So we've had a we've had a UFO expert on before, Dr. Greer, <laughs> whom I'm sure you're familiar with, right? I am. And I'll just say it. I loved Dr. Greer and his entourage, and he showed us some things that were pretty uh, interesting, to say the least. He was convinced he had a picture of an alien, kind of kind of look like lights, kind of look like lights, and, and you know. He left, and I was like, eh. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm acutely aware of that. Uh, my own father was like, son, what are you doing? So you cannot discuss anything that you can't prove in a court of law. So you could have your personal beliefs, but if you're going to go public with stuff, you better be prepared to back it up with facts or enough compelling evidence to sway a jury in a court of law. And that's what I do. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I think your film... Uh, is as world renowned as it is because you had a lot of testimonials from high ranking government officials, the evidence that you speak of. Um, and, 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 you know, Dr. Greer, they do, they do the CE five, uh, where they summon aliens yeah. and they can meditate and stuff. And, um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is like, I just don't know if I, if I bought it, you, you know, and, and your stuff seems a bit more grounded in reality. Even, um, you know, this bit of the many, Articles that have been written on you. This one here says it's from the cut. It says uh, the headline is my favorite hot UFO ufologist has a new documentary. So and, 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 and so you 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 do seem a little more just grounded I and, and hot you know. So are you hot because you are looking for UFOs or are you looking for UFOs because you're hot? You know what I'm saying. I'm hot on the trail. Okay? <laughs> no, honestly, you guys, I'm just Joe Public that decided to do something about a potentially huge story. And I picked up a camera years and years ago, back in my 20s, and I started to say, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. I'm gonna find out what's going on, you know? And I started going to conferences, listening to military guys. And um, here I am all these years later, four and a half films later, um, I've done some of the most uh, 
what are considered some of the most credible civilian efforts for, to push for government transparency. And um, I'm no closer to the truth today than I was 25 years ago. God damn it. I know, I know. But, but, but I can tell you is that there are clearly structured craft of unknown origin whizzing around with impunity. And every government official will confirm that beyond a shadow of doubt. But anybody who says they know exactly what's going on is full of doggy doo-doo. I'll tell you that right now. But it, it, you do the process of elimination if it's not the Russians, if it's not the Japanese, if it's not the Chinese, if it's no other like Swedish. superpower. Yeah, the Swedish. <laughs> I knew it. They were too quiet for too long. <laughs> you know, Fuck. The possible elim elimination will tell you, all right, clearly there's something otherworldly taking place. Who are they? Where do they come from? What, what do they want? And that process of elimination excites a lot of people. It does. It excites me a me, lot. Me, me too. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> but your specialty, correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> is not so much extraterrestrial, um, other interplanetary life, so much as it is unidentif unidentifiable flying objects, correct? UFOs. Yeah, so so I, I've made a couple of other films. I did a film out of the blue, did a second version of it out of the blue director's cut, and then I did a film called I Know What I Saw, and I never, during the production of those films, touched on what are reported as close encounters of the third kind. So... The very guy who investigated UFOs for the United States Air Force was named was Dr. Jalen Hynek, and he was a scientific advisor to the Air Force from 1947 to 69. And I don't know at what stage, maybe it was in the 50s, he's like, all right, we're going to classify UFO encounters into three categories. Close encounter of the first kind, somebody says, hey, I saw a UFO. Cool. Close encounter of the second kind, hey, I saw a UFO, and this UFO interacted with the environment. Maybe it burned someone's face. Maybe it left marks on the ground. Maybe it was photographed or picked, on, picked up on radar. Close encounter of the third kind is when witnesses claim to see occupants associated with the craft. That's some next level stuff because there's one thing to identify a craft in the air and beans on the ground. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So this is the first film I've done where I've I've delved into close encounters of the third kind because I felt like it was a really slippery slope, mm. you know, especially the fact that I'm dealing with high level government and military officials. I, I thought they're going to run for the hills when they found out I deal. I you know I talk about a UFO landing in Africa where the occupants get out and reportedly interact telepathically with all these children. I mean, it's a pretty out there story, right? Like, a UFO lands at a school in broad daylight and, and gets out of the craft at 10.30 in the morning and they interact telepathically with a handful of kids. Do you know about this story? I, in Zimbabwe, correct? This is, Zimbabwe. This, is yeah. this, is, this is nutty. Wild. I know it's nutty. I know it's nutty. It's your new favorite word, by the way. They commented. <laughs> nutty. That's, what, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> nutty, man. Well, this is nutty. But, but I know, listen, I, uh, to everybody out there listening to this, I totally get your reaction to it because when I first heard about it, I heard about it through Steven Spielberg back in the late 90s because I was making my first doc on UFOs and I thought I was just naive enough to think that Steven Spielberg would give me an interview. We had a mutual friend in common and she gets back to me and she's like, yeah, Spielberg's not going to meet with you. But <laughs> since you're doing a documentary on UFOs, he wants you to know about this close encounter of the third kind. He thinks it's one of the most compelling cases in the world and it took place at a school in Africa. And I said to myself, yeah, right. You mean to tell me that a UFO landed at a school in broad daylight and the occupants got out and interacted with the kids and the whole world doesn't know about it? No way, Jose. And I just like kept on and didn't even look into it. So I get your perspective. I get the knee-jerk reaction, but I'm telling you, I have this, <laughs> I have this challenge. It's called the Chicken Parmesan Challenge. If you or anybody watches my, my movie... And they see that scene at the end of the landing and interaction with all the kids, the archive footage and the, and the footage of them today. And you don't believe that that event happened. Chicken Parmesan at dinner. If you're a vegetarian, I'll give you eggplant, <laughs> eggplant Parmesan <laughs> on me. Can I you execute on that, all I those dinners? That's like, I, it could be a I, lot of... I, well, that's that, how convincing it is. I, that's how convincing but, it is. But also, yes. another question a lot. You, you, you talk about it seeming nutty or, or incredible or people you know being blown away by it. Never before have I seen a time like right now where the government and the mainstream were also starting to embrace the conversation around this potentially being something that could be proven. What is it over the past two to three years that has changed to make government officials start to step up and say, yo, we, we kind of want this stuff to start getting out there too. Front page of the New York Times, December 2017. Oh, wow. That was the revelation of a secret Pentagon UFO program, yep. ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, and they released evidence, and then they released evidence that was taken in official capacity from the Navy, from the cockpits of these fighter jets, and then the testimonials of these highly trained fighter pilots 
interacting in broad daylight and pursuing an egg-shaped craft with no wings. The Tic Tac, no, right? The Tic Tac. No, well, the Tic Tac's crazy because I was investigating a 1964 landing case in Socorro, New Mexico. It was a close encounter of the third kind, beings reported with a police officer. And, it's, and back in 64, he described it as an egg. And I was thinking to myself, when were Tic Tacs invented? Because if it was before 64, then hmm. But after 64, he might have said Tic Tac. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, the same thing was seen in, was it 2004 off the coast of San Diego? No wings. No tail, no visible means of propulsion, no exhaust ports, no sound to be heard of that could accelerate from, the st uh, from a standstill to out of sight in the blink of an eye, right angle turns at high speeds, it would go from sea level to 80,000 feet in less than a second. Second, right? Less than a second. Yeah. And then stop above the, the water. It's just impossible. We don't have that technology. It, 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 so it went from what? What was it like? Sixty thousand feet? Eighty thousand. Eighty thousand feet, feet yes. to ten feet above sea level yes. in the back of blink of an eye, like that. It's yeah. not, I, so I want to I want to dive into all these stories like one by one, and we're kind of just going boom yeah, boom sorry, boom boom. Sorry, so, yeah. so let's let's rewind a little gotcha. bit. Yeah, um, of course. Sorry, I'm getting a little carried away. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's exciting. It's a, we we were at my ranch uh, the past two days, and we went out, and when you look at the sky and the stars there are so visible because there's yeah. no light pollution, it's so hard to not feel like there could be something else going on in the universe, you know. And one day I, it's on my bucket list. I'm planning on seeing a UFO so maybe it'll happen but I want to I want to dive into this uh this story about the the school in yes. Zimbabwe yes um correct me if I'm wrong this is uh unreleased no yeah, one's I've never I've never released this footage this particular footage to the general public in any promotional stuff I've done great this is part of the film but I've never made it public this is an impulsive yes. exclusive here we go I put it together just for you. Thank you, bro. <laughs> Dozens of children said that one or more of the disc-shaped objects landed just beyond the far edge of their playground. The next thing they knew, something was standing next to it. And you saw him standing by the, by the silver thing, and he had big eyes. He had a big head and big black eyes and was dressed in a black bodysuit. They were trying to communicate, trying to tell us something. It was something to do with the environment. I kept getting these thoughts and ideas in my mind of technology. Technology is not helping, technology is bad. I believe that the children did see something. I believe them uh, because normally children don't lie. And if you saw him again, what would you do? I'll ask him what is he doing on Earth and what does he want with us? Wow. That's that's crazy. That's that eerie. Crazy? Eerie because she made the comment, kids don't lie. Kid, yeah. do, uh, kids understand the concept of, of fibbing, especially in with goosebumps. independently corroborated stories. <laughs> I get goosebumps. Still to this day, after spending over six years investigating this case, it just gives me the goosebumps when I see that because you know those kids aren't lying. Right, right, right. Is there a chance it was a YouTube prank? YouTube, <laughs> I swear to God. I swear to God. When I was growing up, I... It was 1994. Okay. <laughs> YouTube is, is anybody right, concerned right. at the fact that he was warning us that technology isn't good? Are we, is he trying to warn us that we're going to kill ourselves? I found that claim to be... Very scary. So, uh, I found it to be a little absurd because if a guy coming down in a craft <laughs> that can like do anything, right? Go fucking 80,000 feet in the air in a second, like but what if, go 90 degree turns. And he's like, no, oh, technology but is what bad, if, but like, but let me pop in my machine. But, I can do right. anything at any time and anywhere. <laughs> but what if on their planet tech, that was like the start of their technology and then they saw technology grow, grow, grow until the point the planet was reduced to ashes. And now they fly around on what they have left of technology. And they're giving us a warning. Shut, Yo, you your watch your technology. <laughs> shut your Be mouth. careful of it. <laughs> Craziest thing about that to me, the kids yeah. and the current push of military. It's not the what that's happening. It's not the crazy crafts. It's not the guy with the eyes because we've heard those stories. It's the who is telling the story. The kids that don't lie. The military people. In the past, stories about aliens have always been told by very high people sitting around lava lamps. One eye is slightly <laughs> looking in a different do. direction than the other. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, you have highly trained naval pilots. Shout out, Go, uh, go Navy. Yeah. Pilots, right? <clears throat> Flying jets. Like These people are very smart people talking about these stories and kids that have no reason to lie about it. So that is what's most shocking to me about the entire story. Do you, do you agree? The, 
amount of children, I think 66 of them went on camera for this guy, Dr. John Mack, who was a Harvard psychiatrist. And he, uh, with the backing of Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller at the time, because he's, he's at Harvard, and, and he's looking into this phenomenon, which was a lot less accepted then than it is today. Mm. Uh, and he went and brought a camera crew and documented, uh, there were 100 witnesses, but 66 of them went on camera. And then, of course, you know, 20 years later, they're all saying the same thing. But a, a quick little side note, which is kind of interesting, is that Harvard, because of his looking into the phenomenon and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, they fired him. And Lawrence Spellman Rockefeller called Harvard University, who was backing the, the, the guy at the time, and he said, oh, you guys like those, uh, those Harvard grants that you get from the Rockefeller <laughs> Institute? Yeah, those are going to be gone if he, if he loses his job. And so... They're like, okay, he's back on the job now. Like, wow. <laughs> so that Harvard psychiatrist that flew to Africa, yeah, he, um, he ended up getting hit by a car. He looked the wrong way, unfortunately, in London. It wasn't a big conspiracy. It just, he just looked the wrong way. It can happen. Are you sure? I, yeah, where's he, where's sure. he from? Uh, well, it was Harvard, so. America. So yeah, America. So wait, yeah. just let me clarify this. A man who went to the most amazing school in the world couldn't stop, look, and listen? <laughs> Hold you on know, a second. I know. They go the opposite way. I've done way it there. almost. They do. They go the opposite way. Oh, that's true. Look, stop and listen. God, I've asked. almost done it. I've almost Wrong done it. London the road. Series. I'm dead ass serious. That's insane. Uh, George, you're funny. Thank you. you are. Yeah, you are funny. And we both uh, love you very much. Of the, of the many questions I have, <laughs> of the many questions I have, yes. why a school in Zimbabwe? Like, why are they always in these like remote locations that don't really make? Like, why Roswell? Why a Zimbabwe school? Why uh? There's that doc on Netflix right now, somewhere in in like the middle of the middle of nowhere. I think I could answer that question pretty well. I mean, this is going to be speculation, but can I show you something? Yeah, I'd love that? to see yeah. anything. So, so this is interesting. So you guys have to remember this that. Satchel. Yeah, I know my little satchel here. Um, you have to remember that we take a fairly hostile position. The military does for anything that's unidentified in our airspace, particularly if it's over sensitive nuclear weapons facilities. So. Dating back to, and I'll get to your question, I promise. Cool. This is interesting. I've given this a lot of thought. I've got some really cool stuff to share with you guys. Oh, that oh. looks exactly how I thought it would look. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, was it's just like, I, I love you, you, man. I got you a, a phenomenon sheet that was made by my 20-year-old right. nephew, oh, fantastic. Dow, and he hand-printed those for you guys. What's so, his name? Dow. What, Dow? Size Dow? Is, what size does he think There's I am? an extra large and a large. Like, Dow, like the Dow Jones? Uh, yeah, wow, D O W. Yeah, he made them. He was so excited when I was coming on the show, so he wanted you guys to have those. Thanks, sir. These are phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, thank you. thank you. Yeah. So this is really interesting because in 1952, and, and I'll get to this. I promise you, I'll get to this in a second. So in 1952, we were taking a fairly hostile approach towards any unidentifieds or unknown in the airspace. Of course. To, to the point where there was a, an incursion over the White House and the Capitol building, we talk about it in the film, um, with UFOs over two consecutive weekends in July of 1952. They were uh, shooting at these UFOs. They were actively given the authority to, to engage, shoot, to engage and, and, and shoot at yeah. them, yes. And there was some testimony from extremely credible people that one of them was successfully shot and some of the debris fell to the ground and was recovered. This, I got this very document uh, from the Truman Library, and it was unknown on the internet. I'd heard it existed, but I, uh, it's, it's a very concerned civilian from the Rocket Society who's contacting President, the White House, President Truman at the time, saying, please, do not engage on any of our behalf in aggressive behavior towards what could be an extraterrestrial presence trying to make contact with us. Why are you shooting at these people? This is the original telegram from 1952. You could read part of it. It's but you cool. know, but you know the why. So well, 1952, the beginning of the Cold War, correct? Like we're we're actively in a, in a major yep. issue with Russia. Everybody is on edge. We're waiting for. You know, Absolutely. atomic warfare and Absolutely. nuclear winter. Mm -hmm. And so tensions are already extremely high in the country at that point. So, so. Can I read this? Please. Yes. Go. I got this from the Truman Library. <laughs> the president, the White House. I respectfully suggest that no offensive action be taken against the objects reported as unidentified, which have been cited over our nation. Stop should they be extraterrestrial such action might result in the gravest consequences as well as possible alienating us from beings of far superior powers stop friendly contact should be sought as long as possible stop 
Guy kind of sounds like he was fucked up, man. Well, no, because the stop is a it's telegram, a telegram, so it's telling you oh. to stop. It's, you're not supposed to read that part. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said something beforehand. <laughs> he's drunk, and he's like, Man, he's all, stop, stop it. Stop. 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 So, so anyway, so so in the middle it's of doing my GP. So in the middle of doing this research, I started hearing about these landing cases at schools, and I was like, come on, I just can't believe that school landings could be happening, and that the whole world not know. I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. So there was another case that happened in, in Australia in 1966. It's the Westall Primary School. There were 350 witnesses on that case. 10.30 in the morning, broad daylight, UFO over the school. Every single student, including the teachers, out there looking at this thing in broad daylight. And then it lands just outside of the school playground. And a bunch of kids jump the fence against the will of the, uh, you know, the teachers. Like, stop. <laughs> Total mayhem. And they run out, and they come within 10 feet of this object sitting on the ground, okay, at a school. Mm. So I'm thinking to myself, and then you got the Africa case, there was cases in France, there was cases in England. If you were, and I'm just saying, I'm just speculation here, but if you were wanting to make contact, you get shot at when you're interacting with the military, you have a fairly benign presence with children. I'm just saying maybe, maybe there are lots of cases that have happened where contact was made with children because children aren't going to shoot at you. I'm and buying it. And they're open. So, yeah. I, again, I, I, like I that. know. I like that theory. I, I, just, I love it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying, like, this is something that I've been thinking about. We interrupt this program to bring you a word from our sponsors. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm always looking at a screen, especially now more than ever. And whether you're an avid news watcher or in serious need of a distraction, unplugging yourself is easier said than done. And one of my favorite ways to rest my eyes and still get the content that I'm looking for is by putting in my Raycon wireless earbuds and listening to something great. Whether you're catching up on your favorite news podcast, binging an audiobook, or powering through your workout like I am with a pumped up playlist, a pair of Raycons in your ears can make all the difference. Trust me, I listen to them when I go running, which is often because I'm training for Floyd Mayweather. No dangling wires or steps to get in your eyes or in your way raycons come in a range of stylish colorways but always with a comfortable in-ear fit for a more discreet look raycons are built to perform anywhere and anytime with water and sweat resistance <laughs> i'm sorry that was funny <laughs> sweat resistant construction and bluetooth that pairs quickly and seamlessly and with enough battery life for six hours of playtime, you can unplug for a while and the best part raycon makes great com great sound accessible to everyone with wireless earbuds starting at half the price of other premium audio brands they're offering 15 percent off of their products for my listeners and here's what you got to go to do to get it Buy Raycon.com slash Logan. That's it. 15% off your entire Raycon order. So feel free to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash Logan. Back to the program. But, but why we're on the children, I've never shared these publicly. And I don't know why these didn't make it in the film. This is I'm, great. Because I'm an idiot. So these are, <laughs> these are witnesses. These were drawn by the witnesses as children, as adults, in the Africa case of what they saw. And I got more. Yeah. Why do they always I'm, look like this? I have no idea. I really don't have any idea, guys. Is well, is it potentially is it, is because that's what they look you, like? Is this the original? That's the original. That's Bro, the original. I can feel the crayons I, coming I know, off. I know. You're ruining it. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, all right, listen. Hold on, if I you got... had me draw pictures of aliens without ever having seen them, I'd draw the same thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but those are, the, those are the people that were actually in the playground at the time. Did they uh, drew the, this as as adults or kids? Yeah, uh, I had them. Well, I, I featured the adult. Uh, sorry, the children's drawings, and then those were adult as adults. They've had time to process it, twenty years to think about it. But it's just like it's just crazy stuff, right? Hang on, I got more in here. That's just awesome. just so you know, really quick, this would make a great NFT. Like I mean, it absolutely really would. incredible. It really, the shading's great. Speaking it, of which, in the description, we're going to drop a uh, link to the <laughs> NFT. <laughs> so I got to my little goodie bag here. This is, this is great. So there's a couple more here. From a different person. Yep. All right. Oh, so he had a mohawk. They got style. Uh, what's he looks upset? You know what? No, Look at that's his mouth. not hair, bro. That's beam. They're like he's, he was beaming. I don't know if you guys want to see that. Why? Why are sometimes there's two, and why are sometimes there's one? I, I you know, some of the witnesses said they saw two. Some of them saw, saw one. I really couldn't. Well, tell which you. is it? I know. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then uh, this one is from a woman named Emily. Oh, they were, oh, were this, they big? Emily snapped. Yeah, this, Emily one, this, really one's, <laughs> this one's fire. Okay. Okay, so Emily saw two. And True. somehow Emily was so acting as a drone. So this is an, another... <laughs> another had a bird's eye view. <laughs> Looks like a concert of some sort. <laughs> Don't forget about the chicken parmesan challenge, guys. I know because everyone's going, oh, come on. This landing happened in Africa. My, hey, just no, offer chicken parm to get people watching watch chicken. a movie. <laughs> we're not... No, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. But, but uh, uh, one thing I want to say, if you see these, this is one thing that explained to me. See these logs? 
Yeah. So those logs define the outer perimeter of the playground. And the children, because they, it was explained to me from the uh, head mistress, Judy Bates, that the children were not allowed to go play beyond that, those logs because the, the grasses weren't cut. There were dangerous snakes in the grass and this sort of thing. And so the children, with the, being children, would go to the logs and they would skip and dance along the logs. And some of the witnesses told me, and I don't know why this didn't end up in the film. We just have to be kind of brutal when it comes to cutting things out. Yep. That the, one of the children noticed that the that the beans were j- joyfully and playfully dancing along the children on those logs, mimicking their behavior along those logs. Yeah, Whoa. I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I know. Very uh, benign, very playful, very curious. They said. I was like, God, put me there. I want to be there so badly. When I brought all the children together 20 years later as adults, I just said, you guys experienced something so rare and so magical. Could you please, like, put me there? I want to be there. And so they're like, do you know, have you ever been out in the middle of nowhere, like really remote area, and you come across, you have a sighting with a, with a wild animal, and uh, there's this moment of intrigue and curiosity, like this sort of standoff where you're looking at each other, and you're both equally curious. It's very like a friendly encounter, but the curiosity, right? Like you're both checking each other out. Is this person dangerous? Is this? And they said that's what it was like. Like time would stop, and they were just as bewildered and 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 puzzled by what they were looking at as the beings were with the children. So they're like chi- they're like children in their own right. Do you think that's Hollywood gave uh, aliens a bad rap because? Like, I think back to Mars Attacks, right? You remember no gah, 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 no gah, those ones that take the dog's head off, put it on the human's body, human uh, on the dog's body. Nice. Do, yeah. you think that, uh, do you think that they're coming here to, to eliminate us? <laughs> no, I think, if, look, by their observed technology, if they were here to do us harm, believe me, we would know it. And I've asked that question to military guys <laughs> all around the world about that. And I can tell you a little bit about the why the secrecy, because everyone's like, why would any government hide this from the general public it's the like you know the biggest question in the universe are we alone yeah i mean everybody wants to know that question right and the the military guys look at me and they go dude we don't think that way you have to understand how the military thinks and i've got interviews with generals in france and belgium and brazil and and russia and china all tell me the same thing they said look at it this way and this will make perfectly good sense i think to your to your audience when there's objects of unknown origin whizzing around with impunity in your airspace and they fly rings around your fastest jets and you don't know who they are where they come from and what they want you can't expose what you know without exposing your vulnerabilities and what you don't know Mm. so to them it doesn't it could care less about philosophical implications of are we alone in the universe to them it's a problem defense yeah they don't know who they are they can't be like oh by the way you know they're this is happening they're shutting off our nukes they're doing this they're landing stop right there (laughs) yeah this is the biggest part of the film. Yeah. What are the aliens doing with our nukes and our <laughs> nuclear facilities? I heard I heard they turned them off and on yeah. as like a as a joke yeah. once like yeah. a YouTube prank. So yeah, I know it's crazy. <laughs> with nukes. So I had the distinct honor of of meeting with uh, former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and it was towards the end of production. I'd been involved in the film at probably at about the 6 year mark at that point. And um we did the interview. It was a great interview. He revealed some startling revelations on camera with me. And, and uh, he, was, he was like, hey, just so you know, I've got about 48 minutes to meet with you, and then I'm out of there. I was like, all right, I, I get it. So Why that number specifically? Uh, you know, he was very precise. Like, and he showed, up, four. he showed up like 10 seconds before the interview and left like right on time. He was out there. He had, it was a busy <laughs> schedule. So anyway, about two or three minutes before the end of the interview, I thought, God, I really need a B-roll shot of the two of us walking, sort of an establishing shot. So I was like, Senator, um, would you mind? terribly would, would you have a minute we could do a quick b-roll shot and of course being a politician he knew exactly what i was talking yeah, about yeah. he goes sure so we go to the hallway we're walking down the hallway together and the security details like checking me out and i get too close to him it was kind of weird and um i said uh well i might as well take advantage of these two minutes of walking with senator reed in the hallway i said if you don't mind me asking he, it, and he spearheaded this secret pentagon ufo program called atip that was lasted roughly 10 years i said what was one of the more astonishing aspects that you guys uncovered at this pentagon program and without hesitation, he goes, not just the fact that these UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, are penetrating super sensitive nuclear weapons facilities all around the world, but in some instances, they're shutting them off. And he said, in a couple cases, if the president wanted to launch, he couldn't have launched. And I was like, holy shit. Like, wow, coming from him? Like, we're the third most powerful man? Like, he would have been, you know. So 
I was like, I have to cover that aspect of the phenomenon in the film. And I went back to production. I spent another year. And I contacted wow. the number one researchers in the world. And I put together that National Press Club event that someone, and I featured testimony, Robert Hastings, testimony after testimony after testimony from the highest level military officials exclusively responsible for the deployment of our atomic weapons, the most sensitive, all saying the same thing and nuclear installation after installation after installation which was what we're what, so we we specialize not in harry reed but in riley reed so like let's break this down a little <laughs> Sorry, bit for yes, us okay yes. she was on that mic one time it was in her throat <laughs> <laughs> my question is this how do how do you dis- <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> How do you draw the connection between a nuclear shutdown of a facility and aliens? Right, because and and I'm asking this question because we know that there's a bunch of other things, mm. mostly warring nations, that are trying to do just that. Right, with cyber warfare, they're trying to. And we do it to North Korea all the time. We just say, Yo, your 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 systems are now offline. We get malware into their systems. We turn it off, right? Mm-hmm. That's what we do on the cyber offensive. And people are doing it to us. Russia's doing it to us. Uh, Iran's trying to do it to us, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Why was it aliens that did it? Well, I don't think they're saying aliens. I think what they're saying is you've got a sighting, you know, of all, you got all these military guys looking at a disc hovering over a silo. Oh, well, that changes. Yeah, <laughs> and they're all looking at it. They're picking it up on radar. It's right there. And then all of their systems shut off Got and then it. it just goes poo and shoots off at the distance and gone. And it's really funny. I talked to this launch control officer, Colonel uh, Salas, and um, he was so funny. I, I realized like why this guy was a launch control officer because he was so calm mm. and mellow. He's like, yeah, well, uh, the way I see it, it's kind of like taking matches out of the hands of a baby. Like, <laughs> I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective. Well, I mean, you know. what can a baby really do with match? Yeah, no <laughs> way a baby knows how to light, light, light it. Match. Yeah, I mean, they just simply, maybe like a dynamite or something. Yeah. Um, we have so much technology. We have beyond radar. Yep. We have cameras on every single block. Probably have satellites on, now Now the government owns those satellites, but some of the, some of the cameras are owned by John Q. Public or corporations. Why have we not... Why do we not have a real privately driven footage of a craft? I know we have some of the, we have some government stuff with the with the flights, with the naval flights, but why don't we have some sort of video of a of a third a close encounter with the third kind? We Wait. have people that have talked about yeah. being inside ships. Yeah. We have talked we have people saying they've had anal probes from aliens. <laughs> we have nothing. We have n- yeah. no video. Where is it? Okay, so that's a very it's a great question by the way. And that was one of the reasons why we ended up on the front page of the New York Times because some cockpit official cockpit recordings were made of these objects coupled with eyewitness testimony, coupled with radar, Got ground it. radar, airborne radar. But when I met with Senator Reid, and I've been hearing about these stories of military guys saying, yeah, you know, we, we shot this footage and we handed it over to a government you know, jet and it flew it off to Washington, and psh, gone forever. So I was talking to Senator Reid about this, you know, because I want to know too, like I'm, I'm right there with you, right? And I said, uh, you know, I met with Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper, who was the last American astronaut to go up in space alone. He's an iconic figure of my father's generation, really well-known guy and very credible. And um, he told me in an account on camera, it's in one of my films out of the blue, he's like, um, there was an incident that happened at Edwards Air, Force, Edwards Air Force Base circa 1957 of a landing on the dry lake bed in broad daylight. They were filming an installation of an F-86 fighter jet runway. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this disc-shaped craft lands on the dry lake bed. The guys with their cameras turn it on the craft. And he film it, and it sits on the ground, and then it takes off. And he said he put, literally put the wheel, the gear in the wheel well, and shot off at an extremely high rate of speed. And it was a disc, no wings, no tail, no visible propulsion, blah blah blah. So he gets the film footage developed, and again, he's telling me all this on camera. He gets the film footage developed, and he gets higher and higher up to eventually a courier jet comes in from Washington D.C., picks up the footage. He said he didn't play it through the machine, but he looked at it and he could see the disc on the ground, the, the developed film footage. So I was telling the story to Senator Reed because I'd like to know where the hell that footage went to. Right. And he goes, 
And I said, yeah. And then he hands the footage over to this courier jet. And then Reed goes, and it was never seen or heard from ever again. I went, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. I go, do you know, did you guys come across this stuff? He goes, it's all here. It's all there. Oh, they have it. Yes. He goes, it's all there. We have all of all, it. All where? All where? In the government files, like in the Pentagon. You got to go have, get them. I, I know. So, so look, there's another thing I'm getting to. So I put together a call to action because I've been, I actually went to uh, Washington, D.C. years ago. And I pulled aside uh, chief of staff primarily, but some congressmen, some senators, and I said, look, what is it going to take? They're all, do you think this is a, a, a career-enhancing move for us to go out without the support of our constituents? To, like, look at it there. Do they know what's going on? I mean, some of them do, and some of them hear certain things, but they need to hear from the general public, like, hey, we want more government transparency on this topic. And right before I came on the show, I talked with Lou Elizondo, who, ran, who was the director of the, of the secret Pentagon UFO program, and I said, hey, I'm going on this show. He goes, great. He goes, I think one of the reasons why we're getting as much traction today is because the newer generation are much more open to this. They haven't been jaded with all the other crap that's gone down the pike in the last 50 years. So he thinks that the, a, an informed public is much more difficult to pull the, wa the wool over their eyes. So I have a call to action on the website. I got contacted by this 22-year-old <clears throat> law student, and she's like, hey, I saw your movie. It was amazing. What can I do? I said, well, I'm thinking about putting together a call to action where you can just literally go on my site, click the, I've got the, the, the text already written. This woman, Karina, put it out, and you click it to your, to your congressman, your senator, because the more people they hear from us, that footage does exist. <laughs> I know of footage right now of stuff that came out of the ocean that was photographed last year. I've talked to you know Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo. We, we know these things exist, and we want it out to the general public, but they need to hear from us. Sorry, I'm rambling there. Uh, no, you're, I was just going to ask one quick scary question. Okay, please. You, you talk to Harry Reid, yes. who's, who's you would call maybe third in charge, right? Yeah, he's pretty high level, and then yeah. and, and you go all the way up to the president, right? Yes, yes. The issue that stands here is that those in the know know that there are some people above those three yes L literally yes. like when when the president of the united states whether it be biden trump clinton whoever goes to the senate commission on whatever and says yo i'd like to know about this they say sorry that's above your your <laughs> clearance levels yeah, like like i'm being that you know no, that no, I, do, I do know that. and yes. so so the, the question is is there some sort of rogue unit that is beyond any of our touch beyond uh, congressional constituency or the ability for us to write letters like please stop puppy mills and also at the same time show us alien footage. Right. like yo is there a rogue unit yeah. that says yo f we don't f listen to anyone not the president not Riley Reed's dad Harry no one yeah. it does that unit exist that's a very very good question and I have asked that to uh, uh, chief former chief of staff John Podesta uh, Gerald Ford I interviewed him on, uh, over the phone years ago, and I said, like, if you guys don't have the authority to get this stuff released, who does? <laughs> who does? Like, who, at the president? Because <laughs> everyone's like, well, of course the president's got uni unilateral authority. He can do whatever he says. I'm like, yeah, but if he doesn't know about something, then how is he going to get it declassified? So, yeah, I get that. But but apparently there might be a couple of different, a couple of different sectors. And I asked this, actually, just recently to the guy that ran the Pentagon program, like, he goes, look, man, you don't know, you don't understand like the stuff that I've seen. I'm like, well, what is it going to take to get this stuff released? You know, and he's like, well, we're working on it. We're working on it. But but again, I, I bring back if, if anybody out there wants to actually, you know, get do something about helping this out is that the more they hear from us, I promise you, the more that there's stuff that's happening right now. Warner, Rubio, those guys are talking about this 180 day deadline. I don't know if you guys heard about that or so not. So I wanted to bring this up. Yes, please. OK, because. It sounds like the Pentagon and the government is sort of hearing us yes. a little bit. Um, even even uh, when they released the the Pentagon released that the yes. UFO video of the, of the TikTok TikTok, which we had already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Pentagon has, the Pentagon has released the TikTok God, God of them me. hitting the whoa with aliens. <laughs> <Okay, myself. laughs> God damn it! The TikTok, which I think was already out. But then they officially released it as like, "Hey, this is government is exactly right. backed uh, film." Uh, or media and what was it that like somewhere in the document said in 180 days we'll start releasing this UFO footage which I believe is this year in June yeah we'll start getting some sort of extraterrestrial ET uh, uh, material identified uh, what was it what was it it was material they have to provide a, an intelligence briefing that's going to be made public to Congress 
and that was part of the the COVID relief bill that Trump signed. That was it. Yes, it was like nestled. Yes, way yes. nestled, nestled in there. The nestled in there. It was like, by the way, there. like you know, COVID. Yes. Here's what's going on. By the way, yes. in 108 days, we're gonna tell you about aliens and the yeah. material. Yes, <laughs> I know. But there are people that want this out. I'm telling you right now, there are people within government that feel that, although it's a little scary to some, to me, I feel like, hey, it's reality is reality, whether we're, we're whether we're aware of it or not. And um, I think that everybody, man, woman, and child, has the right to know about what's going on. Do do we? I don't know. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean. So, I do. What I do kind know. of right? Now, now, I, I ask this: like a moral right, uh, an ethical right, uh, 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 a civil right. What right exactly is it that we have to know the highest levels of government intelligence? Do you know? What, this is this is a question Human I'm asking. Rights. Well, look at it this way: it, if yeah, that's what I'm asking. If there is tangible evidence that would suggest we're not alone being withheld uh from the general public i feel that's unconscionable i mean whether it's a little scary or not i feel like it's it's information that we're all should be entitled to i really do i i believe that in the, i i would love to see my six-year-old son grow up with this not being a secret with this not being covered up with this i think it would force the human race and i sound a little wiggy here but i'm serious to see ourselves for who we really are and that's one race, one planet. I, I really that. believe that. I, I really do. I love that. And I think that we're all entitled. And it's one of those topics that transcends religion. It transcends politics. We're living in incredibly divided times right now. And this is something we can all get behind and agree with that, hey, man, this is fascinating. And this pertains to all of us. But I, I, I've never heard it put in that way before because it's a very uh, utopian yeah. outlook on why we should know about aliens. The thing that worries me there is it is human nature to create teams, yeah. okay? And right now, at the greatest level, our biggest teams are USA versus Russia, right. USA versus UK, and we all rally. Right. What if the the downside of getting this exposure and understanding what that aliens exist creates an Earth versus <laughs> X-52-77? Space you know what wars. I'm saying? Yeah, space wars. <laughs> right. Is that, I mean, could that happen? Well, look. The the government officials, the military, the pilots that I've interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of all around the world. I'm not trying to toot my own. I just have. Yeah. And uh, they've all said to me, look, man, if they're here to do us any harm, do we be toast? Like, they they fly rings around us. They make a joke out of our technology. What if they can only just fly fast? <laughs> <laughs> they have no weapons. No, no, no weapons They're just no. so, they're, they're like, like hummingbirds. Yeah. No, they can't really is, do this much. Is, no, this is, anything. I'll share this story with you. So I interviewed this guy named Parviz Jafari. He was a general in the, in the uh, uh, Iranian um, army, uh, military. He had this dramatic encounter over Tehran, Iran in 1976 in a F-4 fighter jet. I think it was an F-4 fighter jet. And, uh, and it was this really dramatic encounter and he talks all about it and then he tries to shoot this thing and he l gets his lock on it and he goes to shoot it. I have him talking all about this on camera. And he tried, just as he's about to pull the trigger, his whole plane locks up. And he, literally, and he literally thought he was gonna die. And he was getting ready to hit the ejector button at like two in the morning over Tehran, middle of the night, flying at like 500 miles an hour. <laughs> he's ready to eject out of this thing because he's like, I'm toast. And all these years later, I interviewed him. I flew him in from Tehran for an event I did it in, in 2007, the National Press Club. And he goes, you know my biggest regret? And I was like, what's that, Parvis? He goes, uh, why did I try to shoot at this thing? Why didn't I try to make friendly contact? I tried to shoot at it. Why did I do that? I thought, wow, this guy's been thinking about that all this time later, you know? Like he goes, they didn't try to do anything harmful to mm -hmm. me. Why would I try to shoot him? It's like a human reaction. Yeah, right? It's so, it's so it's weird unknown. that that's shoot our... It. Yeah. But it locked it up. It comes from it, fear, though. But, but according to him, it knew before he would pull the trigger what he was thinking. <laughs> oh, and no. He shut his... Yeah. <clears throat> These testimonials are fascinating. They really me. are, Especially right? from people who, you know, probably a trustworthy guy. Oh, very, oh my God. Uh, absolutely. human being. When Greer was on his podcast, Dr. Greer, he said that Buzz Aldrin, I believe it was Buzz Aldrin, made a claim to like his sister, not on the media or something, and it kind of like sprinkled through a couple folks that when he was on the moon, there was craft there. No, I, I, know, back, I, I, I know the story. Do you no. know anything about I, this? I know, the, I know the story very well. Is it a story? It, it is. is well, it legitimate? well, so here's the deal. Uh, I worked on a movie set years and years and years ago with Mickey Rooney, uh, the legend of Obi Taggart in New Mexico. 
And the people that I was working with were like, oh, so, Sonny Boy, I was in my early 20s, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, mm. oh, I'm doing this documentary on UFOs. And they were like, to me like, okay, well, you know, I'm friends with, uh, with, with Buzz Aldrin. So I was like, wow, could you get me an interview with Buzz Aldrin? And they're like, yeah, he told me some crazy stuff back in the day. Like he maybe, you know. So anyway, fast forward like a couple months later, I'm in Marin County, which is where I live in Northern California. And um, I meet this woman, Faye Ann Potter. She's an art dealer, and she's like my brother's Buzz Aldrin. I was like, really? And all of a sudden, this Buzz Aldrin stuff starts happening. So I was like, I told her, I was like, I was on the movie set. I was with this guy, Mickey Rooney. He promised me he would get in touch with your brother. Like, what's up? Like, what does he know? We met at this restaurant called The Left Bank in Larkspur. And uh, she's like, yeah, he had this really dramatic encounter while he was piloting a fighter jet, and he chased it all the way as high as his jet would go. He said it rocked his world so hard, he just couldn't, it was a disc. And I don't remember what year it was, she didn't know. But she said he called me and he was totally freaked out. Then uh, in 1969, what is it, July of 69, when they went to the moon, and I'm telling you, this is just what Faye Ann Potter told me personally. And that was they saw something that followed them to the moon. <laughs> Did not say <laughs> anything about anything <laughs> on the moon, Nothing on the moon, but it was something that followed them to the moon. So I was like, oh, my God, it'd be amazing if I get your brother on camera. So long story short, she puts me in touch with Buzz Aldrin, and he says, yeah, I'll meet. She goes, you got to meet with this guy. He's amazing. And, you know, so he goes, okay, I'm, well, I'm on book tour. I'm in Monte Carlo. Tell him to get his butt over here and meet me in Monte Carlo. So I borrow ten grand to get a camera crew and film. I was broke as a joke, man. I didn't have any money. I was, but I was like, I got an interview with Buzz Aldrin. So get all this thing. I fly to Monte Carlo, and it's like the cheapest place I could. I was looking at boat anchors that cost more than all the money in the world that I had. Right? Yeah. I was like, oh, I couldn't even afford that boat anchor, right? <laughs> anyway, we're staying at a hotel, and he kept putting the interview off. And I was like, God, I was like, it's like four hundred bucks a day just to stay here, and I'm staying in like a rat infested hole. Like, come on. So after like the third day, I said, I said, Mr. Aldrin, with all due respect, I mean, you promised me this interview and I flew all this way. I got a camera crew all standing by and he goes, okay, okay, okay. He goes, well, meet me in my hotel room. Tomorrow morning, he gave me this fancy hotel. And so I, I showed up 15 minutes early. I'm having a coffee and a croissant and all excited. I'm going to see. And he goes, don't have any cameras rolling. I said, no cameras will be rolling. And, uh. And I get, and this concierge comes up to me and says, Mr. Fox, I, oui, uh, you have a telephone call, uh, Mr. Buzz Aldrin? I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, I can't do the interview. Oh, shit. And I went, I, uh, what do you mean you can't do the interview? He goes, I, I can't do it. He goes, Paul Allen just invested in SETI, which is NASA's search for extraterrestrial right, intelligence. Right. And he got labeled this UFO nut, and I can't jeopardize this initiative of putting civilians in space and developing this rocket oh, with Congress. Man. He goes, and what the hell difference is my story gonna make anyway? And I said, well, Mr. Aldrin, it takes people of your stature and your credibility to come forward to help elevate this whole subject matter. He goes, well, I ain't doing it. Uh -huh. And then click, fast forward, that was in 1999, I think, or, or 2000, 99 or 2000. Fast forward, uh, I go on uh, Larry King Live with uh, it's online somewhere. I go on Larry King line with the former governor of Arizona. And guess who makes a guest appearance at the same time? It's Bu Buzz Aldrin. Buzzier. And I walk by the green room, and there's Buzz getting his makeup done. I got a picture of it somewhere. You're not supposed to take it. They're not supposed to take a picture of people getting their makeup done. But I was like, whatever. And then I turn to the governor of Arizona, a Five Simonton, and I'm all, I'm going to nail this guy on, on live oh. TV, right? <gasps> And he goes, James, you can't do that. That guy's, he landed on the moon with, with Neil Armstrong. He's an icon. He's a rock star. He's a rock star. Rock star. Yeah. Like, you can't do that. I'm like, he, I, don't know what I told him what happened. He's like, yeah, but still. I was like, this guy never apologized or anything. I was like, he left me <laughs> hanging. Like, you know. And so uh, I went on the show with Buzz Aldrin. It was live. And I just watched him lie to everybody. I'm like, just looking there going, mm, okay. Oh. Yeah, and that was that, man. No. Yeah, God, so you almost God. had it. I swear to God. Do you think he'll come on Impulsive? And tell his story. I got his number. I got his number. You should reach it. You that would be it. the best. You might be able to break. <laughs> you won't dox him. Hey, crazy. Crazy. You know what? What are the oh, odds? <laughs> oh, oh, God! I'm so glad oh. you reminded me of this. So, the He's best. A hoe? You talked about. <laughs> you talked about UFO footage. Can I? Oh, uh, oh, he, no. we tried. Oh, you tried. Well, you know what? No. <laughs> Kate, I get. I got twenty. I got twenty no's from most people before I get the interviews. So never stop trying. <laughs> nineteen more, Dill. <laughs> you guys got nineteen to go. So, I, um, you talked about UFO footage, okay? And I'm going to say this because you guys have a big audience, and I there's people in Los Angeles area, and I know because I've seen the footage, that have the most compelling UFO footage in the history of ed of ever. Okay. I was working on my first documentary. There was a guy I was interviewing that was out in Nevada. His name was Chuck Clark. And um, 
I get a phone call from him. We've been dealing back and forth because he's participating in my movie. And he calls me up and he goes, James, he goes, I got, I got something you got to see. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what is it? And he goes, oh, I ain't going to tell you what it is, but I'll tell you what, when you see it, your jaw's going to hit the floor. And I went, that good? He goes, oh, oh yeah, that good. Hung up the phone, jumped in my car, drove 12 straight hours. I get to this guy's double wide cabin in, in Rachel, Nevada. Swear to God what I'm telling you is true, okay? He pops the tape in. And it's a VHS tape. And I said, what did you get? He goes, just, just watch. So I watched this, and there's two guys on the quintessential road trip from L.A. to Area 51. It was really popular in the 90s. And they're, like, goofing off next to the signs, and they go the little alien. And hey, look at this little UFO. Hmm. And they're just being silly, having a good time, road trip, music. All of a sudden, the car stopped. It's dusk. And the camera is, is cocked on the armrest, and it's shooting the dashboard and the, and the windscreen. And it sounds like, and I couldn't see, but it sounds like the two guys in the car are trying to climb under the seats, and they're screaming at each other. And all of a sudden, the car lights up. Like, if you could imagine, like, here's the car. If there's an object above the car with a light on a pendulum, and it's moving very smoothly, like fluid, like back and forth like this. So the light source is moving, yeah. and all the shadows on the inside of the car are moving in this really fluid motion. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And it's, it's over the top of us. Get under, get under. So I think it's happening above the house right now. It's I know, awesome. right? So uh, I'm looking at this footage going, my God, this is unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, is that, is that what it sounded like? Are well, they coming no, after you could us, hear man? a pin drop. You could hear a pin drop. So, so anyway, I, I'm looking at this footage, and then the younger guy, because apparently it was a 19-year-old and a guy who was like 29, he goes, I'm getting out. I'm going to no, stay in the car. It's over the top of us. Ain't no problem. He goes, I'm getting out. Never seen again. <laughs> I promise you, I saw this footage with my own eyes. It's here in Los Angeles. The guy gets out of the car, takes the camera, and he pans it up, and right about the height of a telephone pole, you could hit it with a rock easily, was this perfect disc. And and I'd interviewed a lot of people that have just tried to describe what the disc looked like and had the flight characteristics and how it floats, but I'd obviously never seen it, so I could only imagine. I've only had words. And I could see why they've had so much difficulty describing what this looked like because the skin on this thing was like glowing like it was alive. I swear to God. And it was sitting there rocking like like this, like kind of rocking like an like a boat on the ocean, like really fluid and smooth. And it's glowing. And then it had these like, like if you, if you took a pie and you cut perfectly uh, symmetrical piece out of the pie and where the seam was was slightly darker but all around it everywhere else was glowing so it wasn't like a light source it was like it was a lot i don't like this one this I know. Is, no, 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 no 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 because no, i've been no, thinking this for five you, fucking because minutes you love no. pie I'm sorry. no that's not why it's not because right. the pie i'll tell you quickly okay. I'm, I, I, two, two more seconds go, yep, I'm done. two go. more seconds and and the guy just goes and you're thinking like i i just looked at it go this this fills in all the blanks this is the most amazing footage i've ever seen the guy goes oh my god and then the camera shuts off. And that no, was it. have you ever seen Blair Witch Project? No, li stop. I'm Listen, telling you. I'm here's telling why you I don't. Here's why there. I don't like this one. Here's why I don't like this one. Two 19-year-olds on a trip to Roswell or to Area 51. Their first Pl mistake turned out. Like playing, to with, be playing their last. with aliens. Like, yo, let's be honest. These guys set up a fucking storyline. They're at Area no, 51. No, 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 no. They got the aliens. I don't think so. The, the car. Mm -hmm. Stop! They're lifting us up! No, because like, it, it has wasn't. every single part of a, of, of a trailer. No, because it wasn't produced. It wasn't produced. It, didn't, it wasn't distributed. So here's the, Wait, here's no, the cool uh, thing. No, here's the yeah. cool thing. Sorry, go ahead. Where's the footage? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the yeah, footage? Where's the Footage. Yeah. James, because yeah. this is where you lose me because you're saying these things. I'll pay good money for and it. And where is the footage? Yeah, I know. I'll trade a crypto. I'll, I'll tell you it. right now, Chuck Clark has it. Who is that? Dick yeah. Clark's brother. Chuck Clark, he wrote a book, uh, nice. this manual. There's people going after it. But look, what's man, I'm just what's telling you. I need it. Here's Chuck, I'm coming. If I'm somebody, coming to Chuck if somebody, to Chuck Clark. Chuck, I'm he's coming. coming. To find you. I need if, to find this footage. If somebody, I'm going to do a, to what I did with Pokemon to UFOs. Yeah, if, if look. The market's I booming. Saw I know. Look, I'm just as frustrated as you guys are about it. Do you, how do you think I feel? Like, Why is he hiding it? He's it's not hurt. Okay, so I know, right? <laughs> 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 so the guy, so what Chark told me at the time, and I harassed him for 15 years, and he goes, if you ask me again, I'm never going to talk to you. And then I asked him again, of course. He never talked to you. Never yet. talked to me again. Wow. Who, who is he? So he Chuck stuck Clark, to his guns on so that he one. Wrote, he wrote the, uh, uh, the Area S4 of 51 handbook. Um, he was an amateur astronomer. He was, he'd located 
at Area 51, when Area 51 was really hot back in the 90s, he'd located these vantage points on these mountaintops where you could see down see onto the base right. and like where you wouldn't violate national security or go where you weren't supposed to go. Chuck had done all that stuff. And he was just out there. He was a fixture out there. And these kids were on a road trip and they were laughing and mocking. And then they drove out of town and they had this encounter. And then they came back into town and were like, we think we shot something that the government's going to kill us over. That's what he told me. They think they captured a secret military craft that's completely secret on camera. All right, well, maybe they, well, maybe they did. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I, they did, maybe maybe I they said. Don't. I, yeah, uh, that's uh, what they said. And so I said, if, just put me in touch with them and let me talk with them. And if, he wouldn't do it. If you don't mind me asking, why did he blue ball you by like showing you? And he's like, all right, that's I all know. you yeah. Why do you want to show you? I, yeah. I, he made you drive 12 hours for yeah, that shit? He yeah, blue balled yeah. you. No, he he blue pulled out a tit and yeah. didn't let you hit. Can I ask uh, you? know what I'm saying? What yeah. a tit the conversation. Is nice. The reason why I mention it is because the people that shot it live in LA. One of them was in, working in production and somebody, they, it's it's here in Los Angeles. The footage is. I'm sure I they want that. We got clout. We got money. We, we, we got to go get them. I want to see it come out just as badly as you guys. Will Believe you, me, I saw it. I've been thinking about it. Would you trade all your Pokemon cards for that footage to own it? <laughs> no. Would you uh, give me an? I wouldn't. Would you give me an Instagram pop tag? Instagram pop tag. Yeah, oh yeah. So do they? I'm sure they like clout, right? Like everybody I'm gonna else. I'm going to find this. I'm <laughs> right. going to find this footage. I'm not going to tell you what my plan is, but I'm going to find this footage. I, I hope you the do. Maverick Club I really do. I don't. <laughs> and even... I'm posting it in the yeah. Maverick Club as an <laughs> NFT available only in the Maverick Club. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah no. I, I I think that footage should be out there, and it frustrates the hell out of me because it was so good. And I've seen lots of footage and gone, eh. That footage looks fake. No, man, this was like screamed authentic. I want to rewind a yes, second sir. just to hit on bitch. something yeah. else. And I have a photograph to show you guys Sorry. as well. So. Sorry. You oh, son oh. of a bitch. Sorry. Did I, did I un unplug. Did I unplug them. I want to rewind just a second because Mike asked a good question that I was actually curious about. Is that, you know, we hear all these stories about the 50s, the 60s, mm. the 80s, 90s, mm. you know, when, when um, filmography was obviously not as prominent. Mm -hmm. And now, every. Everyone has a cell phone. Everyone has that method of mm -hmm. capture. Yeah. Um, and yet we're hearing and seeing, well, hearing so much less about these visits. And yet everything nowadays is documented by everyone. I don't, I think that's what he was asking earlier, but I don't think you answered that. Like, like, is there a chance that these visitors, whatever the fly, the pilots of the craft are aware of the ever evolving age of technology that's happening in the human race and kind of pulled back a little bit. That's, that, 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 that's, there are very few people that have actually made that, that, uh, that, uh, observation, like very few. And I've had discussions with this at very high levels. Like, why is it, these things are ubiquitous. Why is it? And first of all, there are stuff on YouTube, as you know, but it's so hard to make the distinction as to what's fake and what's real. Yeah. But I will say that uh, I was told from intelligence people that there's footage taken from an iPhone in a Air Force jet from the Navy in 2020 of an object the size of a football field, triangular shape that came out of the ocean and went straight up past these jets. Uh, I know. I, I'm telling you that footage exists. I can't I, wait to see this stuff. Christ it's going to happen Christopher, one day. Christopher Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, told me that it existed. Yeah, we gotta get I'm him. trying to we put gotta go pressure on the government to have it released. They know it exists, and they know that there's lots of other very compelling photographic evidence that is yet to see the light of day. But it's there. Also, if, uh, if uh, the intelligence that we're talking about could know when a man is about to shoot at you, yeah, don't you think they know when you're about to... Take an IG story, because mm. this is this is all we have right now. This, weekend. this was this past weekend. Oh yeah, that, I heard about this. Yeah, okay, here we go. Know. American Airlines flight two two nine two. Something go right over the top of us. Pilot reported this. We just had something go right over the top of us. That I hate to say, this looked like a long cylindrical object. It almost looked like a cruise missile anything? type of thing moving really fast that went right over the top of us. It happened on a Sunday when the military doesn't typically perform military tests. Since then, so this just happened, and then there was something else in LA recently about. Uh, oh, can uh, you look something up? That's yeah, crazy. Sure. Uh, look up 1994, 1995 Salida UFO, because that's a, that's the best cylindrical UFO footage I've ever seen. It was taken by Tim Edwards. It, and it's footage. Yes, it's footage, and it's a cylindrical object over Colorado in 1995, I believe it was. Okay. That's it. Yep, that's it. See that cylindrical object? It's pretty good footage. It's long. 
It's long, so you, you might so have what to. So what are they, what are they saying? This might be the alien, like their version of a school bus. Well, it could be if you look at it sideways. Discs. I don't know. It's a uh, error occurred. Yeah, so, yeah. They don't want us. They don't want the us to right. watch this. I got the year right, 1995. No, Tim Evers. I'm, I'm on the wrong Wi-Fi. So uh, okay, cool. Excuse me. No problem. <laughs> I could tell it's old YouTube because the video isn't 1280 right, by 1920. Right. It's pretty much a square. <laughs> so, yeah, but you're... They don't want us to watch it. They well, don't want us no, to watch it. No, I have to watch this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty... Dad? Listen to the, what the daughter's saying. Huh? Dad, can, huh? can a spaceship grow bigger like that? Can a spaceship grow huh? bigger like that? Whoa. Huh? Whoa. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! You can, you can see it's uh, it's shimmering and uh, it looks yeah, like it look alive, like it's alive. Where where was this? Salida, Colorado, 1995. Okay, okay. Tim Edwards shot it. Okay, so I have another question about this stuff. The 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 another issue with videos like this, mm -hmm. and especially when they're in Colorado, Nevada, some of these places are the testing grounds for for advanced research projects. DARPA, right? Is that what it's called? Uh, Skunk Works, like all of these all of these people that have said, and this could go either way. This 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 could be a project of the U.S. military, correct? A any of these can. The disc could be any of them could be U.S. military projects, correct? Is that is that a possibility? Not at this point. Why do you say that? Because the highest level government officials said that we simply don't have that technology. We don't have the ability to fly without wings. We don't have the ability to fly without conventional propulsion. Yeah, you have objects that can hover, that can accelerate from a standstill to out of sight, right angle turns. We don't have it, and they say we don't have it today. So I, so I like that, and I'm yeah. on that side. Yeah. And all of the people that have said... This stuff isn't real since the 1960s. They said this isn't real. There's no ship that can uh, detract radar. That just can't happen. Then all of a sudden, the SR-71 came out. Where did that technology come from? Absorbed radar didn't emit any kind of radar det detection. Right? They said there's no way a, sh a uh, airplane could lift flat off flat off the ground like that. Then the Harrier jet came out and it lifted straight off of aircraft carriers without any kind of runway whatsoever. So uh, on your side and the side I, I agree with on this, it seems like this tech is coming from somewhere. Like where is the tech coming from that we keep putting into our... But the conventional uh, propulsion from the Harrier jet is just jet engines that... Correct. And the, and the SR-71 can't stop. It has wings. It can't like hover and it makes noise and it makes a lot of noise. And these things violate every known principle uh, that, that we have. I mean, they don't make a sonic boom. How do you, how do you travel but, supersonic speeds and not make a sonic boom? The, the only other anti point yeah. on that one is. And I'm saying I don't know where these things are from. I, I really don't. And I think that anyone that says they do is, 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 is don't, not telling the truth. Right. No, I really the, don't. the only other anti on that point is, as you know very well, we are generally 30 to 50 years behind on military tech, especially here yeah. in America. So, like, we didn't find out about the SR 71 until. I don't know what, like the 90s or something like that, and it was operating over Vietnam. So, like, whatever we do have, DARPA has right now, Skunk Works is now defunct, I think, but whatever we have from an advanced research standpoint could be 50 years ahead of what we know. We could have flying disks right now that are that are ready to operate, that are some sitting in some warehouse that we just don't know about yet. Well, this is what I wanted to ask about. Yeah. I don't think we do. You don't think so? You know Bob Lazar? Yeah. His story's fascinating. Yes. Do you believe all of it? No. Uh, let, me, let me tell you just drama let me yeah <laughs> let, 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 let me tell you I believe that he believes he's telling the truth you I believe think he's like insane no I wouldn't say that he was insane but could he have been used as as disinformation it's possible what are you talking about well I know but but I'm just saying it's a you you, you have to understand my position is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence I haven't seen and I've traveled asking questions at the highest levels I haven't seen any indication that we have successfully reverse engineered that technology. I do believe there have been crashes. I do believe that Roswell happened just as they said it happened. I believe that the debris was recovered, but all the guys that I've talked to said, we didn't know what that, we didn't know where the engine was. We couldn't even find an engine. There were no provisions. Well, if you look hard enough, I'm sure you'd find it. And, and so, well, seriously, <laughs> yeah. some, of, some well, of his claims are, are were hey, I'm not, I'm not, well, no, no. 
no, I'm not. Yeah, he could have been. Yeah, of course, he could have been where he said he was. He could have been shown things mm. and said there were this when they were that. I don't know. But, but yeah. how do you prove what he's saying is true? You just, it's really hard. I, I you know think, what I mean? okay, so I, but, yeah, but I, I believe, agree. I believe that he believes that he's telling the truth. I always have believed that. That he <laughs> believes that he's telling the truth. We've had this conversation on this podcast before about the truth. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. How subjective yeah. truth is. And yeah. always, you know, the fucking yeah, truth. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, okay, so then rewind his story. And yeah. a lot of the claims that he made that turned out to be true later. Yes. In my opinion, verified and validated a lot of the stuff he was saying, which made it easier to believe him for the really, really far out claims that he made. Yeah, right. Like with the, with the, with the hand device that yeah. was able to yeah. Symbi measure, symbiotic. measure bones and symbiotic. Oh, that thing. Yeah, right. So security to get in right. Yeah, and everyone thought yeah. he was crazy. Then yeah. it came out, yeah. and um, I think there were a couple other ones. Maybe the the element. Right. There wasn't there like an element. Element one fifteen or yeah. something. Yeah. I mean, look, there's no smoke without fire, but. But again, I, I, I remember actually talking to someone who will remain nameless at the New York Times, and we were talking about Bob Lazar. And I said, well, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? And she was like, mm, maybe he might be telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but I can't go there. I was like, I, I gotta get, I gotta get that. But how do you verify? And again, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I believe that he believes he's telling the truth. Whether or not we have successfully reverse engineered hardware that we have recovered, is a big unknown to me. And I hate to like just land flat on that one, but I just really haven't seen the evidence. I because just that's what I was getting at. That's why I started this is, is what are the chances that we've recovered some sort of craft and we, humans are, are now piloting it and using it. I'd love to, I mean, Hey, I would like, well, they've been doing a pretty good job of keeping it secret for 75 that's years. That's true. And, yeah. and by the way, I look back at the declassification on that SR 71 and it was, it was only about a 15 year, year lag between full declassification. And so by this point, if we had recovered an alien craft back in the 1960s, 1970s, we probably would know something about it from I'll, a reverse, reverse engineering standpoint. I was really reluctant to cover Roswell in my film, The Phenomenon. Because, I want to hear about this. Because I was like, uh, Roswell's kind of a hot potato. It's been there. It's been done. And people have been banging on about it. I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to cover it, what I did was I was, looking in, I was looking into this incident called the Rockefeller Initiative. It was during the Clinton administration. And Lawrence Rockefeller at the time, uh, billionaire, uh, was putting significant pressure on the Clinton administration saying, you're going to, you know, you're going to open up the files for UFO files or I'm going to expose the fact in every newspaper publication across the United States that you're not going to do that. Basically strong armed the president. So the president basically was like, OK, what do you want me to look into? Is there, is there a particular case? And Rockefeller said, yeah, how about Roswell? Because Roswell, I mean, if it was popular. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's hardware and it's beans, apparently. Yep. Yep. So the Clinton administration, believe it or not, went after Roswell and uh, at the highest levels. And Podesta on camera told me we were not happy with the answers we were getting. So they were making inquiries about it. So I covered Roswell because I'm like, I can't touch on Roswell in the film, assuming that I do penetrate a much broader audience, more mainstream audience. They're not going to know much more than the average Joe about Roswell. Let me just cover the core facts. And that is that the very people that were responsible for the uh, deployment of atomic weapons, the 509th Bomb Squadron, announced to the world this is all a fact that they recovered a flying saucer that that's a fact and it made headline news around the world like that even back in 1947 then they were taking the debris in a b-29 bomber and they were flying it to wright patterson air force base dayton ohio which is where the reverse where the foreign technology division was with a stop off it in, in, in texas fort worth and when they got to texas get off the plane, there's a flurry of military activity and, and, pu and publicity with the media and everywhere. And the base guy looks at the, the people on the plane and they keep your mouth shut, let me handle this. So he goes quiet and throws some debris from a Roswell weather balloon and says, terribly sorry, what we thought was a flying saucer turned out to be a weather balloon. Well, almost everybody in that press photo went on the record on camera before they died and said, the original story was true, it was not of this world, this is what we recovered. When so, I was in uh, high school, I was taking physics mm. and we had a lesson on pseudoscience one day and uh, he was going through different things that were definitely pseudoscience, you know, alchemy was on the list. Um, I forget, there's a, there's a, there's a, maybe like 10 things. And one of them was the Roswell incident. And so my whole life, wow. you know, I, I grew up believing because of what was taught to me in school that this wasn't real. And, 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 you know, I'm not making a stand at this point in time, but I think it's fascinating how 
what you're told can resonate with you for so long and then you open your eyes to something and realize none of it's true. Like, think about it. Mm. A high school teacher told me that this thing wasn't real. And I, and I assumed, because he's the teacher, he's the authority, right? Yeah, I yeah. assumed it to be true. And it's almost just like I had to slap myself on, on my wrist and stop just accepting things that are told to me. And this is why this whole UFO thing fascinates me because there's so much more when you peel back that first oh layer. totally you know my father was my biggest skeptic my father was a mainstream journalist and when he found out that i was going to do a documentary on ufos he was oh. begging me not to do it son you're you're wasting your life you're going down a dead end road blah blah blah. <laughs> and i was just like well you know being a Taurus, i guess that propelled me to, to work even harder and so i get like the resistance and now you know i've gone around the world and I've talked to these people and I and I'm like and bring it on Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson you want to like you want to go to debate with me you, you're an extremely smart guy but you don't know what you're talking about when it turns to this field I can out I know what I'm talking about you haven't even you have an even bigger skeptic in Elon Musk yeah so well, so Elon, Elon so Musk, Elon was on Rogan recently just to give a little context here I got, he's uh, got the chicken parmesan challenge I he, guarantee you he'll see that movie he, he'll and know he'd they're real definitely take that challenge he says honestly I think uh, if I would know hey, if there Clark. are aliens uh, I mean, if they wanted us to know about them, they would just show up and walk down the street like, "Hey, I'm an alien. Check me out. Here's my spaceship. I just landed in the middle of the square." And we'd be like, "Okay, I believe you. These are very, these are they're very subtle. These aliens." Uh, Rogan asked him uh, if he ever thinks about UFOs. He said zero. If they show up, I'm like, "Great, this is new information. Like, where were you guys up until now?" If I see some evidence for aliens, I'll be the first to be like, "Ah, aliens." And finally, he asked Musk, "Does uh, does seeking out aliens feel like a waste of time to you?" And he said, "Yes. Uh, if there were aliens, they're very subtle. They're pretty shy. So as far as we can tell, there's none." Uh, nor are we seeing signals from any other solar system. That's Elon Musk on aliens. And Elon Musk is an amazing guy, and I respect him tremendously, but he simply does not have the information. It's as simple as that. If he watches the phenomenon, and I know you guys are like, oh, you're out there pushing my movie. Well, of course I am. Like, uh -huh. I did we're, that we're movie. Jo we're joking. That's oh, yeah. what you're here to do. Yeah, no, that's what I'm oh, here I to do. It. Yeah, get it. That's what <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, here to do. Sure. Like, sure. I believe in what I do. I don't do it. I did, never made that movie for the money. I did it because I felt like there was com really compelling evidence yeah. that hasn't seen the light of day. A part of history that was almost erased. I mean, you look at like all those major incidents and all those headlines that we dug up over an eight-year period. That stuff would have been just like forgotten and like fallen away and never talked about right so i know that if elon musk watch, watches the phenomenon I, I i put anything on it that he's going to say you know what i have to rethink what i just said because there's very compelling evidence to suggest that something really truly profound is going on and has been this is this is a conversation for another day because i th this particular one because i think we could uh we can go on to it forever but for me the biggest evidence that there's something out there. It's just simply looking up, man. Like when I go out and look into the night sky and, mm. and try to take into account the vast, endless, eternal size of the universe and, and even just our solar system and then the galaxy beyond that and all of the, the infinite space that is out there, it seems so short-sighted and, and, and uh, local to imagine the idea that there's nothing else out there. It ju it just does, man. It just can, can I share one quick story of the man who walked on the moon? Of course, He's a really good friend of mine. He passed a couple of years ago. I was devastated. Edgar Mitchell, six man, Apollo fourteen, walked on the moon, and I was in there interviewing him about UFOs at his home in Florida years ago, and I said, "I'm so sorry to ask this question of you because I know." that you must get asked this all the time, but what was it like to walk on the moon? Yeah. Like, yeah. come on. Of course. And I said, could you please just, you know, would you mind? Could we just like, you know, pause for a moment? He goes, yeah, James, I'll, I'll do that. And so I sat there and when I want to really capture a story someone's telling, and I did this with Travis Walton when you told me about what it was like when he woke up aboard that craft, I closed my eyes. And I closed my eyes because I want the words to recreate the imagery in my head so I can see it, right? So I closed my eyes and I listened very carefully, really carefully. And he described, he's like, you know, I, I might as well have been in a simulator for three days. We're hurling through the vacuum of space towards this. We're watching the moon get bigger and the earth get smaller. And, um, but he goes, I might as well have been in a simulator because I was so focused on the task at hand. I got the transluter injection. You know, we go around the earth and then we got to hit those blasters and we got to get the trajectory just right. If we're, if we're off, we boom into the, into the moon or we ricochet and off into space and we're done. And so he's like, you know, you got to get it just right. And so he gets to the moon. And then his, his responsibility was landing the lunar lander, right? So he's like, you know, in this thing, he goes, I might as well win the simulator because we, we touch down and, and turn off all the systems. And he said, you could, it was so quiet. 
And he said, you could hear these macrometeorites pelting the skin of the craft. because They were paper thin, right? The walls of that thing. And NASA was like, you guys, you guys need to take a break. You've been up for three days. You need to sleep. So they put their, they went in, they got in their little bunks and they were trying to sleep. And they're like, you know what? The hell with this. Let's, we're on the surface of the moon. Let's put our suits on and go to explore. So they're out there on the surface of the moon. And he looks out and he watches this earth rise. Okay. And he said, there was this blue marble suspended in a vacuum of black darkness that you cannot even imagine like it's our life support system and he said it rose like up like this this blue marble and he reached out and he put one hand up like this and he blocked out everything he knew all the cultures all the wars all of everything and he had this profound epiphany about it there were invisible borders like one race one people you know and i got to have that moment with him and i think about it you talk about looking at the night sky Every time I look at the moon, I think about Edgar Mitchell telling me that story. And I was so glad I could share it with you guys today. But that's, he's, that's, yeah. Incre- that, that's incredible. Isn't that incredible? incredible? I know. The whole idea of it is just, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. And it's it, all gone. <laughs> yeah. It's all just behind your hand. Yeah. And then he's like, he's like, then we realize like, we have to get back in this little lunar land. We got to shoot off. We got to reconnect with the lunar orbiter. We got to do a trans earth injection. Like, we, you know, it's going to be a hell of a journey getting back. And he had this epiphany on the way home about this deep sense of interconnectedness with consciousness and he ended up uh, uh, founding um, the or, uh, an institute that was actually in Marin County um, I'll think of it in a minute but it, but in any case uh, yeah just incredible absolutely incredible and is there is there like a loneliness or lack of purpose maybe that any of these astronauts feel when they get back to the earth I, I can't imagine going to another planet and then coming back to earth <laughs> wouldn't affect me in some yeah, way. Yeah, I agree. Completely. You know what? I, like, Just hearing that story yeah, yeah, and yeah. thinking about yeah. putting your hand up and blocking out all that you've yeah. ever known, yeah. ever about everything, yes. yeah. and then simply putting your hand back away and returning yeah. to the noise know, that is this right? ridiculous pursuit that we all uh, go out on every single day. I can't even imagine what that solitude must have felt like to be on the moon looking at this madness that exists on this planet from a perspective that we've never seen before yeah. is mind blowing. Yeah. It, it, it left an indelible mark on me and I, I think about it almost every day. When I see the moon, I think about him telling me what it was like to stand on the moon and look back at Earth. I mean, it's just like... Why do you think we haven't been back? Uh, you know, if you look at the Apollo missions, I mean, we were barely even noticing. Like Apollo 13 only got even noticed because of the problems that they had and they almost died, right? Yep. The, the public had moved on and they, they lost the, the civilian support. It's a very expensive program. Yep. But, but Elon Musk is bringing it back and we'll be going, we'll be doing missions to, the Mar- Mars. to Mars. Yeah. And I think uh, what they said, we're going to land men on on the moon in the next couple of years. Yeah, right? where they're trying to bring it back, right? I think, but, but costliness yeah. as well as, uh, I think, like, end of mission feeling like yo we know what we know it's right. not made of cottage cheese right right you right. know like they, what, are the, what are the flat earthers gonna do I, oh my gosh <laughs> i know not funny <laughs> what are, what are, seriously what are they gonna do they just disband it <laughs> like hey we're on the oh moon oh my the gosh Earth. oh my gosh I know. it's not I, flat yeah well no 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 no. they're not gonna disband what do you mean they that's all cgi but at what point it's is CGI. it fucking not? No, well, according <laughs> to them, it's CG fucking I, dude. Like, he, you know, all that's fake. Unbelievable. That's even gotten any traction. It blows my mind. You know, we have a documentary. Really? It's my, our fa- my personal favorite piece of work I've ever been a part of. Oh, Ever. Wow. Ever. Really? Ever. Are you being serious? Flat Earth. Oh, come on. I swear to God. <laughs> pull it off. Flat Earth no to the edge and back. Really? Oh, yeah. We went to the edge, dude. Quite literally. You're being and serious? Spent, yes. Yeah. So and you took... Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry. We we a balloons? posed as flat earthers and went deep deep undercover into the community for you. Ha- what a great idea! It, mind blowing. Do you want do you want to watch the trailer? Yes, it's I'd two, love it's two to. And a half yes, <laughs> yes I we love this love movie. To. Let's go! I would love to. Uh, uh, that is so cool. Here's the ch- flat Earth to the edge of back. Yes, the official trailer. Dude. Conspiracy theories. We've all heard them. Global warming, it's, it's a hoax. Who killed John F. Kennedy? But even crazier, people that actually believe them. I'm going to say this as a friend. Do you think the Earth is flat? The Earth is flat. Wait, the Earth is flat? The Earth is flat. Satan's greatest lie. The destruction. The world that we're living in has been misdescribed. What shape is the Earth? Flat. 
think that the Earth's flat because if it wasn't flat, then we would all be falling off of it. Oh my God. It gives me great pleasure to announce for the 2018 Third Flat Earth International Conference this many people can start questioning the reality. The truth sets you free. evidence they presented that they did go to space is nonsense. Do you acknowledge that other planets are round? I don't acknowledge that other planets are planets. People like could think that it's round is because like the shape of your eye is round. We don't have toilet water flying out on people in Australia because of gravity. When you're taught that you just came from nothing because the scientific narrative is nothing exploded and created everything. And we're crazy. I didn't know any of this stuff before I came here and like... You're still learning. The truth to set you free. I can teach you some things. It's tough because you've been told something your whole life and you've been a certain way, right? Stop becoming a flat earther! I'm not saying I am. Man, Robbie, I just don't know what to believe anymore. The truth to set you free. 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 <laughs> My name is Logan Paul, and I, I think I'm coming out of the flat earth closet. Yo. <laughs> I'm sorry. There has never been a more underappreciated piece of content. I know. Ever. I know. Wow. Ever. Dude. Oh Ever, my dude. Oh, my God. It is so good. You know, I, my neighbor... I, I can't believe I'm saying this. My neighbor, who I've known for a long time, he's like, well, you didn't know the earth is flat? Like, they they, no. they kind of throw me in. Yeah. <laughs> and they throw me into this whole conspiracy thing because I do documentaries on UFOs, but I'm like, I can back up everything I'm saying in a court of law, I swear. Like, I don't make any outlandish claims. I really don't. And I let the audience, I let the viewers just, you know, make up their own minds. But I realized, I was like, I'm not going to change this guy's mind. <laughs> and I'm not even going to do an engage. I'm not going to engage. You know I'm what not going to engage. No, nothing I'm going to say is going to change his mind. Exactly. You got evidence? They're not here. So I literally just go, great, happy for you there, buddy. I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not going to change someone's mind. You're just not. Hey, you can show them a photograph of me. Yeah. I, I, that's all it's we, a little that's, scary. That's all we got, man. That was awesome. The pull up to what? Oh, I have a photograph to show you guys. The letters? Oh, I have I have the letters. The, uh, they're small. Yeah, he knows what they Okay, what are these letters, Dylan? Okay, so this is kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah, this is really cool. This, God. They're hard yeah, to read. I, okay, so... It is kind of hard to read. I'm sorry that the quality is as bad as it is. Can I? Uh, so, if you see about the third line down, there's a pyramid-looking thing with two lines in the middle of it to the left a little bit. Oh, right here. Right there, yeah. So that was written in Dr. Jalen Hynek, who was a scientific advisor to the Air Force investigating UFOs in an official capacity. There was a landing case that happened in 1964. I cover it in the film, and it's the most well-documented close encounter of the third kind in U.S. history. And it's, it's uh, you know, it was a witness was a police officer. The craft was like a Tic Tac. It was white. He called it like a, more like an egg. And um, it had a big symbol on the side of it in red, about three feet by three feet. And there had been so much speculation swirling around for over 50 years about this symbol because when the military arrived within an hour on the scene, they said to the witness, who was a police officer, Lonnie Zamora, okay, so first of all, don't say the real symbol. Because we want to be able to quickly identify a hoaxer. If somebody else says they saw this craft, oh, yeah, that's the symbol on the side. They'd know immediately to identify a hoaxer. So rightfully so, they said, let's obfuscate the symbol, and let's say you saw this symbol. So the symbol, the real symbol never saw the light of day. During my investigations of this case, I went to the National Archives, and I won't bore you guys with the details, but I eventually got access to the original Project Blue Book files, which was a total coup. I, it was like that sound of... Oh, when yeah. the guy rolled him out in the cart, I was like, oh, it was like a halo around him. It was like the originals. <laughs> and I found this letter from Dr. Hynek dispelling once and for all the real symbol that was on the side of the craft, which is the most well-documented close encounter of the third kind in U.S. History, history, which occurred in Socorro, New Mexico, 1964, April 24th. And here, people think like, you know, there's just like, oh, you know, anecdotal evidence of stuff. You got a UFO a very credible observer, a police officer in uniform who describes his craft. These are official photographs that were released that I also got, and these are the landing pods of the craft. You can see, not terribly exciting, but 
but still evidence that something interacted with the ground. It wasn't just a hallucination. It left imprints from the landing gear in the ground, which were photographed and taken rather seriously by the Air Force. This was later declassified. Those are some of the uh, bushes that were affected by the propulsion. It had a blue flame initially that came down. It didn't ricochet off the ground and stir up the dust. It actually penetrated the ground like a knife through warm butter and went down into the ground. But when it got to 20 feet, everything shut off and it was completely silent. No lights, no engine, no nothing. And um, yeah, and it was really well. And there were right where the police officer said he saw two beings dressed in white coveralls. They were diminutive. He said they were small like children. And he, the police officer thought, like, what am I looking at? Is there a car that's overturned? Like, he was trying to provide a con conventional explanation, which generally what happens. And one of them, he was kind of calling out to one of them in, in his patrol car. One of them turned and looked right at him. He got eye contact with one of them. And his wife, Mary Zamora, who went on camera for me for the first time, she goes, whatever my husband saw, he was never the same. And he never wanted to, to talk about it. But anyway, so that's the, the symbols. That's the original. That's the real symbol written spelled out by dr heineck that never made it in the movie i'm so sorry the quality is this bad i thought it was going to be better than that it's so it's a little pyramid with an equal sign yeah, and so it's like this with two lines here and then one on the top got it and, and did extensive research i'm gonna keep an eye out for that yeah and there's one other document that i was going to tell you guys it's not funny this kind of relates to to the name of the of the documentary we were like what are we going to call the movie for like five years we didn't have a name for it we're like when it when it come, when, when when we find it, it takes us that long to title these podcasts. Right, 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 right. We're yeah. still we're still working on a couple right now. <laughs> I know it worst. takes a long time. So we came across this 1947 memo by General Nathan Twining, and basically given an assessment of UFOs, and he says the phenomenon is uh, reported as something real and not visionary or fictitious. And we thought they've been calling this the UAPs the phenomenon since 1947. So we're calling Perfect. our film The Phenomenon. Fantastic. And in the T-shirts, we took this exact font from 1947. That's where our T-shirts came from. That's, oh, definitely, the phenomenon. Cool. that's yeah. definitely a better title than Equal Sign Mountain you know, symbol title. Yeah, and the thing is, is that we're not screaming from the hilltops, E.T. is here, or little aliens. We're just putting the evidence on the table, allowing people to make up their own minds. Go watch The Phenomenon, people. <laughs> Do it. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> that's all we got. That's all we got, James. <laughs> I appreciate Thank you coming you. on Impulsive, man. I really appreciate you guys inviting me on. Seriously, I had a really good time, and I hope I didn't talk too much. No, that no, was great. That's, that's what, that's what you're supposed to do. To do yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's a podcast. Yeah, appreciate you. Uh, watch the Phenomenon, obviously. Where can they find you on social media? Well, go to the Phenomenon Film, the Phenomenon Film com, and it's got all the information. It's got the trailer. It's got links to where you can rent the film for like a couple bucks. If you want to buy the film, then you should get it from iTunes or Vimeo because it comes with three hours of bonus material. Uh, for no additional cost. Fantastic. And I didn't realize that. I provided three hours of killer material that just didn't make it in the movie, and only two platforms accepted it, and that was iTunes and Vimeo. But if you're going to rent it, just rent it from the cheapest place you can find. Okay, cool. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening to Impulsive. Hit that subscribe Thanks. button. We love you. We'll see you next time. Take it easy. Bye. <laughs>